and welcome to Hidden History Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel, along with my co-host, Ray Smith. Good afternoon, Ray. Well, hello, Keith. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, doing good. Um, yeah. Let's just get right into it. We have a couple of special guests today. So we I'm do. Gonna... I am so glad that we have these two with us today. And I'm going to introduce Tim Coates. Tim and I met in Washington, D.C. at an event for the Atomic Heritage Foundation. And we hit it off immediately, or at least I thought so. He invited me to come up and see his reactor at the University of Maryland. And I did. I went up there and uh, and had a wonderful day with him and, and looking at all of the exhibits he has there. And oh, by the way, Keith, we want to do a second program with him. Today, we're going to focus on Miriam Herbert and her book, but he has so much to offer that he's agreed we will re we will schedule another time for Tim to talk about his activities more than he can do today. Okay. But I'm really glad that we've got them with us today. And Tim, I'll let you go from there and, and introduce Miriam to us, okay? All right, thank you very much, Ray. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, and I am so glad that you enjoyed the visit to the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, that was really evidenced by your invitation to come down to Oak oh. Ridge. And uh, uh, you, you certainly won up to me by uh, uh, giving me the, a personalized grand tour of the Calutrons and uh, yeah. not even on the Calutron floor. What, what I remember, uh, the, well, outside of the security uh, detail, um, it was clearly the most secure facility I've ever been in in my life and uh, was going into the basement of the Calutrons and seeing the switchboards and motor generator sets that that was you never see that photo anywhere the yeah. the, the hallways of a uh, Calutron co operating consoles uh, is, is ubiquitous but the, nobody gets the basement tour and that was fantastic <laughs> oh you're uh, right he, he, Keith he's talking about Y12 and I did take him into beta 3 and and did take him to the basement yeah, yeah, fantastic. Amazing. Really, one of the top ten. And, and, and Tim, you need to you need to know that when Keith was making the documentary film, the Oak Ridge story, he was able to go into the upper levels there and, and film the the calutrons and the control panels and and use that in the movie. So yeah. you're not the only one that's got to see it, but you're one of the very few. And I remember, uh, it really, uh, Tim, I don't know if it was still the same way when you were there, because I know there were some, some flooding issues. But when I when I shot uh, that, we went down into the basement and we found uh, spare tubes for the Calutrons that were dated September 1943 or something like that. They had been delivered. Uh, they were they were big old big old glass tubes for for as, yeah, as strong tubes for the power supplies. Yeah, so yeah, uh, and the, yeah, what what uh, yeah, it was a wonderful uh, tour, and so what prompted that was on Ray's visit to the University of Maryland. I said, you now you've you've seen a lot of interesting things today, but sit down here and uh, put out your hand and and be ready to hold this impressively heavy small two inch cube. And what he was holding was a two inch cube of pure uranium metal of natural abundance. And uh, it was very early on in my quest to understand the, uh, the history of this cube. This cube at, uh, was purportedly originating from the nuclear reactor in Germany that the uh, Werner Heisenberg and colleagues were trying to build in utmost secrecy for the German nuclear program. And we've subsequently uh, found out that indeed that uranium cube has come from there. And uh, Ray, what had happened at, since that meeting is somebody coincidentally, completely unrelated, handed me a second cube. Oh. And, and at this point I realized that uh, I was not searching out this history, but the history is searching me out and uh, about a year after uh, the visit that you had me down to uh, Y12, a fairly new graduate student was using our nuclear reactor to use it for uh, non-destructive imaging using the neutron beam. <clears throat> and this is at the same time I was compiling all my notes into a form of a PowerPoint 
slide on the uranium cube history, uh, the things that I'd learned. And I've kept this uh, uh, utmost secret because I knew I was some, something special, was, was some story uh, was going to evolve from this. And I shared it with about three people, you, Alex Wellerstein, and my friend Stuart Hannabeth. And Stuart immediately said, this is going to be a book. <laughs> and I said, yeah, 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 no, I, I doubt it. Well, I am, I am super delighted to say earlier this week, uh, Stuart's prediction uh, came true. Stuart also predicted uh, the Hubble telescope in, in his grade school, and he predicted PayPal. So he, he, he is a man before his time. So, uh, but you'll notice that uh, my name uh, is only in small print here. Dr. <laughs> Miriam Hebert is the author of this book, and she was that new graduate student at the time. Uh, Mimi Hebert uh, uh, and I paired up and worked on this while she was a graduate student, but this is not part of her thesis. I was not her thesis advisor. Upon graduating, uh, she uh, did stay at the University of Maryland, and I was her postdoctoral advisor in, in a very unique situation. The University of Maryland completely funded her postdoc internally, which is very rare, uh, but they also understood the historical and science history importance of this story. So uh, Mimi uh, subsequently got a contract to write a book. She took my PowerPoint slides, which I think you'll see probably the 50th uh, draft version of, of the original draft. Uh, it's <laughs> evolved a lot. A lot more information has gone into it. And uh, she did the, all of the heavy lifting and turned this into a very nice uh, manuscript, uh, historical uh, document. I wanna say one more thing before I hand it over to Mimi and was that I got involved in this entire enterprise by my uncle handing me a copy of Richard Rhodes book when I was around 10 years old. And this is the making of the atomic bomb by Richard Rhodes. Yeah. And it was at the exact same event that I met you, Ray, that I met Dick Rhodes right. and, and Clay Perkins and and uh, Chuck, uh, not Chuck Norris, um, uh, Mr. Norris. Stan, Stan Norris. Stan Norris, Stan Norris. And uh, Chuck Norris might have been there too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of you have since become lifelong friends and colleagues and supporters. And it was at there uh, I saw... Uh, Dick Rhodes having coffee all by himself. So I went over there at about age 39 at this point and sat down and I said, you don't know who I am, but I'm Tim and uh, you have singularly influenced my career into the nuclear realm. Your book, um, uh, every child has a dinosaur phase and a chemistry phase and a computer phase and then the nuclear phase. And I got stuck in the nuclear phase due to his book. And uh, we've become uh, great friends. And in fact, he's the the first person to give praise in the back cover also. So he's been a supporter of this uh, this project from, from the beginning. Um, so oh, I, I have to say that I'm no longer the leading expert in the uranium cube history um, as a parent wants better for their child, a, a postdoctoral advisor wants better for their understudy. And uh, Mimi Hebert is now the world's expert on the World War II effort of the German nuclear program and the, the chase of these uranium cubes. So I, without further ado, Mimi, uh, tell us what, what, what we know, what you know. <laughs> I learned something now every time Mimi gives a talk. This is great. Very good. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, so I guess uh, you came to kind of gave a background into how I got involved in this project. It was definitely not my thesis, as you mentioned. Um, but once I was sort of introduced to this whole story and you put the cube in my hands and it was just the coolest thing that I think had ever happened to me, uh, I was completely stuck. And I started helping on this little journey uh, through graduate school and then after. And it's been quite the adventure. And I'm really very excited to finally see it in a published form that I get to share and talk about with other people. Um, so I have some slides that we can go through, but it can be kind of more of a conversation if you want or however you want to do that. Um, so I will share my screen. Now, we, we will feel free to interrupt if we have questions, but just go ahead with your presentation. Okay, so... The book is called The Uranium Club, which I'll explain why I chose that title at the end. Um, so we're going to start, I guess, with the cube. 
So the first cube I was uh, made aware of. Is Mimi, you're, we're seeing your uh, preview slides. Hmm. Interesting. Just hit, hit the presentation. Presentation view slideshow. Yes, no, maybe. There you go. Yeah, that okay. looks better. Yeah, great. Okay, great. Okay, so starting with the, the cube that I was first made aware of was this one, which I believe is the second one that Tim was made aware of, but this was the first one I encountered. Um, so this is the cube that was handed to me in Tim's office one day. Um, and it comes with, a, it came with a note when Tim received it that I have found to be very helpful in tying together all of the different parts of this story. So the note reads, taken from Germany from nuclear reactor Hitler tried to build, gift of Nininger. And kind of contained within all of that is all of the different pieces that you have to put together to understand the full scope of the story. So we're going to use the note and go through <laughs> three different timelines uh, to try to piece together everything that is important. Okay, so... I, I probably don't need to do a timeline <laughs> of nuclear history for this particular crowd. Um, but what I will point out is that it's a very short amount of time and that during the entirety of World War II, the German scientists and the American scientists had no idea what the other side was doing. They were both working in complete uh, lack of information or communication with each other. So that's that's really an important piece of the story is that the Germans thought that the Americans were working at approximately their pace and the Americans thought the Germans were working at the Manhattan Project pace and both of them were wrong. Um, so within this whole like six year time period, all of this happens, uh, but we're gonna start with Taken from Germany. So the Manhattan Project, I'm sure everyone also knows, is the U.S. effort to build the first nuclear weapon. It was headed by General Leslie R. Groves. It was massive. Uh, it cost $2 billion at the time, which was like $32 billion today. It was very expensive and employed 600,000 people. Uh, it was such a huge effort and, and undertaken with such fervor because the United States assumed that Germany would be well on their way to making their own nuclear weapon. They assumed that they had had a two-year head start. They had some of the most famous names in nuclear physics. And why on earth wouldn't they have already made significant steps towards building a nuclear weapon? But as Germany began to fall, no nuclear weapon appeared at all. Um, and it was uh, became a matter of trying to figure out exactly how far Germany had gotten. They clearly hadn't made a nuclear weapon, but how far they had gotten. And there was also a great deal of concern at keeping anything that they had accomplished during the war out of the hands of the Soviet Union. So capturing all of that information and figuring out how far the um, Germans had gotten became a top priority for the Manhattan Project. And that resulted in something that was called the ALSOS mission. This was a top secret military intelligence mission uh, that was tasked with acquiring information about German scientific progress just in all fields. Um, they had a biological weapons um, division. They seized from Germany the very first scanning electron microscope. They, they were very much focused on all sorts of um, different types of scientific development. But... All of that was really a cover to, to hide their true focus, which was trying to determine the progress of the Germans' nuclear program and capture as much of the materials and people as possible. And the ALSOS mission really was undertaken by three individuals. Uh, so the first person is John, La John, eh, John Lansdale Jr. <laughs> Um, John Lansdale uh, volunteered for military service in the military intelligence division where he worked as a first lieutenant under General Strong. Um, and he was originally tasked with processing reports, um, Nazi and Soviet threats. So any kind of like espionage that was happening within the military complex, he became responsible for. And because of his job that he'd sort of found his way into, he was tapped to handle what I refer to as the Berkeley incident. Um, it became apparent that the scientists working at Berkeley on the large cyclotron that they were building there were not being as careful about who they were talking to as they ought to have been. <laughs> So John Lansdale was sent there undercover uh, and he accessed, you know, the labs. He was able to walk right into the laboratory where it was being built. Uh, he was also able to sit down and have lunch with all of the physicists who were working. And in a matter of a couple of days, he'd gotten pretty much everyone to tell him pretty much everything. 
Um, and he came back and reported what he had found uh, and got to go back to Berkeley a few days later, this time in his full uniform and, and yell at the scientists and try to <laughs> impress upon them that they needed to be very, very careful about who they were talking to about what they were working on and its potential implications. Um, but because he had been involved in the Berkeley incident, he had already been made aware of the nuclear program uh, and and the Manhattan Project in its early stages. And so that led to his selection by General Groves to lead Manhattan Project security. And Groves made sure to tell him that it was not because he was particularly qualified for the job or impressed with him in any way, but because he had already been let in on the secret and Groves wanted to keep the circle as small as possible on who knew what was going on. Um, but they ended up getting along fairly well, which was not that common for Groves. He did not uh, have the most easy to get along with personality. The second person who was involved uh, in the ALSA's mission was Boris Pash, who's kind of an enigmatic figure in general. He was born in San Francisco, but he was raised in Russia. His father was actually a very high ranking member of the Russian Orthodox clergy, um, and he fought against the communists during the Russian Revolution and moved back to the United States when the Bolsheviks took over. And this led to his lifelong complete and blind hatred of communists in general, um, which played a little bit of a war uh, uh, role during the Second World War when he enlisted in the army in 1940. At this point, he was in his 40s. He was one of the older people who was working at the time. Um, and he was posted to the Western Defense Command in San Francisco, where he began to uh, lead investigations into USSR espionage. And the focus of one of his most uh, fervent investigations was Oppenheimer. Right. He's responsible for the recordings that were used to crucify Oppenheimer after the war. Uh, and he was doggedly against Oppenheimer being given a security clearance or being involved in, in the Manhattan Project. And it is suggested a few times throughout the literature that he was chosen for the Alsos mission to get him off the continent and out of Oppenheimer's way so that Oppenheimer could do what he needed to do without this person <laughs> opposing him so fervently. Um, he met Lansdale during the Berkeley investigations and he was eventually chosen to lead the Alsos mission into Italy and Germany. Okay, the third person in the Alsos mission was the scientific lead, Samuel Hauchmet. He was born in The Hague, he was Jewish. Um, he is responsible for the discovery of electron spin with George Ulenbeck in 1925. He's fluent in Dutch and German and English. Um, and I believe he has a smattering of other languages as well. And because he was raised in Europe and was an integral part of the European physics community, he was really connected with all of the European physicists, particularly Bohr and particularly Werner Heisenberg. Um, and this is interesting because they hoped this might make the scientists more willing to talk to Hauschmidt when they, they were captured. Bohr, you know, was not a problem, but Heisenberg in particular. They were hoping that his relationship might be an asset. He was also chosen because he was not involved in the Manhattan Project in any way. He had been working on radar development at MIT, uh, so he didn't pose a significant security risk to the project should he be captured. But he was a... a good enough physicist and familiar enough with um, the work that was necessary that he was going to be able to understand the data that they were likely to encounter as they were moving their way through different laboratories. Uh, so he was chosen as the scientific lead for the project. This picture is one of my very favorite things that I've come across in the whole uh, project. This was taken at the University of Michigan in 1939. Samuel Hauschmidt's wearing the white there. Um, and in the middle, you see Warner Heisenberg and directly next to him is Enrico Fermi. They're all there in Michigan um, for a conference that was being held that summer. And this is just a few months like before the war began. Heisenberg was begged to stay by all of his colleagues during this time. He refused and, and went home to Germany uh, and communication was pretty much abruptly cut off after, after this meeting. Um, but Heisenberg and Hauschmidt were really good friends and Heisenberg was staying at Samuel Hauschmidt's house uh, throughout the summer. And then all of a sudden they become enemies uh, within a matter of weeks. So I think it's really interesting to think about how tight knit this community was and how stark the divide suddenly became when the war began. Okay, so the ALSOS mission had many different phases. Um, their initial uh, investigations were in Italy. There was not a lot of nuclear work that was being done in Italy. They didn't come up with a lot of um, interesting data, but what they did get out of their initial 
trip into Europe was an understanding of how they needed to operate in the field. It became apparent that they needed to be the first ones on the scene, no matter what, uh, in order to capture the people that they wanted to capture, in order to see the things, the laboratories, the spaces before they were looted, which happened fairly quickly. Um, and so that really informed their, their operation system as they moved forward. So Italy was their first. They then set up a base in London. And after D-Day, they were able to move into Paris. The Alsos mission was actually the very first American soldiers who entered Paris as the Germans were pulling out. They were the sixth, I think, Jeep in line <laughs> entering the city. They were right there because they'd learned their lesson in Italy. Um, and then eventually they make their way into southwestern Germany, which is where they find the majority of the, the Germans' nuclear program. Most of what they find is located in a teeny tiny town called Hagerlach, which is in the Black Forest in, in southwestern Germany. And on April 27th, they arrived there and they found an abandoned lab inside of a uh, beer cellar that's carved out of a cliff wall underneath of a castle. And this whole town is perfectly medieval. It's it's darling. Um, and so the this wine cellar, this beer cellar had been converted into a laboratory for this specific project, but it's it's a small, cramped, damp space. They found heavy water stored in barrels in a mill nearby. And they also found 664 two-inch cubes of metallic uranium buried in a field. Uh, and all of this, they moved back to the United States and you can see a couple better pictures here. You can see the cubes all stacked up. And what's also interesting about the vault is you can see the slices of uranium metal um, because there had been some discussion about the correct geometry for a reactor. So the slices become important, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute. But I, I just love the picture of the tower. It's so much uranium in such a little space. <laughs> and that whole pile must weigh so much. And this is one of the evidence that had to have been at least just natural abundance, not in real. Yes. <laughs> They're stacking it up and nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened next to these materials? Because clearly, like the cube that Tim handed me that day is in this pile somewhere. But how it got from this hilltop in Germany to College Park, Maryland is still still kind of um a question that we haven't entirely sussed out. But there's a few suggestions in the literature. Uh, General Groves in his book, Now It Can Be Told, says about one and a half tons of uran small metallic uranium cubes were dug up from a plowed field just outside of the town. These two were quickly dispatched to Paris. Both heavy water and uranium were then shipped to the United States to be disposed of by the Combined Development Trust. So there's one sort of clue. The other bit of evidence that I have found compelling is this memo, which uh, we came across at the National Archives in College Park. It's from Samuel Hodgmitt to Robert Furman. It, the subject is activity of the material. It never specifically mentions cubes, but I am fairly certain that that is what is being referred to. Uh, he says, with the help of a Geiger counter borrowed from CWS, a rough measurement was made of the material stored in a depot in Paris. The material is packed in wooden boxes about one inch thickness. And the measurement is not accurate enough to determine whether the material required any special activity as a result of the experiments to which it was exposed. But we know that the type of experiments done makes any appreciable additional activity very unlikely. So my reading of that is that he's talking about the cubes that are in um, in a crate somewhere in Paris and that they were, they were used in an experiment, which they at this point knew was not a critical reactor experiment. And uh, he was just relaying this information so that the cubes could be safely transferred back to the United States. This is really the closest we've come to an actual sort of receipt of some kind, uh, any kind of real textual evidence that that the cubes existed in Paris and where they were moved. Uh, we were hoping we might find some sort of shipping documents or anything like that, but we've never been able to come across, come across anything more solid than this sort of suggestion. Um, but, you know, that's history research sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of part one, is the Alsace mission. The next part of the story is the reactor that Hitler tried to build. So backing all the way back up and talking about what was going on in Germany at the time. A little bit of background uh, on German physics. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute uh, was founded in 1911 to promote the natural sciences in Germany, and it quickly became the center of the physics world. Most of the, the really important discoveries and, and discussions and scientists were working out of the KWI. 
Um, it's subdivided into 29 institutes, individual institutes. The KWI Institute for Physics was founded in 1917. The KWI for Chemistry was uh, initially founded in 1911. There were some weird institutes like the KWI for Leather Research, Cell Physiology, Vine Breeding. And there's also the you know very dark side of Nazi Germany with the KWI for Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Eugenics, which was founded in 1926 and was responsible for conducting uh, experimentation on concentration camp prisoners. So uh, it's an indication of how science and and the politics, the, the political uh, environment that it is in are really hard to sort of keep separate. So most of the German research program is sort of centered around two figures. The first one is one that everyone's probably heard of, uh, Werner Heisenberg. Heisenberg was born in 1901 in Warsburg, Germany. He got his PhD in physics from the University of Munich in 1923. That means he was 22 when he got his PhD, which is an annoying fact. Um, from 1924 to 1925, he worked with Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, where he, he developed the field of quantum mechanics, just because. Uh, and in 1932, he was given the Nobel Prize for his work. He was really considered Germany's golden boy of physics. Um, James Chadwick, who was a member of the British nuclear program, called him the most dangerous possible German in the field because of his brain power. Like the, the amount of mythology that sort of surrounded this person and his, his intellect is really important to understand uh, for, for why, why the uh, program ended up working the way that it did. In 1939, and before that, as I mentioned, his American friends had begged him to take a job in the United States. He was offered jobs at all of the famous universities, and he consistently refused, saying that he wanted to be around to maintain and rebuild the reputation of German physics. He was really kind of nationalistic in his idea of Germany as the center of the physics world. The other important thing to know about Heisenberg is that he was a theoretician. He really hadn't conducted an actual experiment ever in his life um, at this point. <laughs> And, and that comes into play as well. The other character who's important in the German nuclear program is Kurt Deibner. He's much less famous than Warner Heisenberg, but played a very important role. He was born in 1905 in Eastern Germany and got his PhD in physics from Martin Luther University in 1932. He began working um, and consulting for government, which was at that point Nazi labs right out of grad school. Um, and he was an advisor on nuclear physics to the Reich's Ministry of Defense and the Army Ordnance Office. He was what they continually refer to him as a good Nazi. Um, he was not viewed as part of the academic science community. He was very much a party man. And he was disliked pretty significantly by most of his colleagues in the physics community in Germany. The term that they continually use to describe him, which I think they they there's a level of vitriol that's hard to understand with this term. So they call him a second raider consistently throughout, <laughs> throughout all of the literature writing about him after the war. The thing that is important to note about Kurt Deibner, however, is that he was an experimentalist. All of his sort of um, science research was based in the building of experiments and the testing of, of those experiments. Um, and that comes to play in how he, he viewed the project. The German nuclear program, like the American nuclear program, which began with the Einstein letter, also began with its own letter. It was dated April 24th, 1939. It was from Hartek and Groth to Eric Schumann who's the head of the weapons research um, at the German, German Army Weapons Bureau. It discussed the possible new explosive technology that was stemming from all of the publications that were happening following the discovery of nuclear fission uh, earlier that year. Schumann was pretty skeptical, but he brought it to Kurt Deibner, and Deibner immediately recognized the significance of this and uh, established a research effort, which he called the Uranium Club. There were military orders issued to nuclear scientists across Germany to attend planning sessions in Berlin. And kind of an afterthought, one of the scientists who had been invited decided that it would also be a good idea to include Warner Heisenberg. So he was at the first meeting and at all subsequent meetings. Um, but because he was a theoretician, he was sort of not the obvious person to talk to about this, um, but he was included and that proved a bit fateful. The Weapons Bureau um, it takes over the KWIP. So this sort of academic Institute is suddenly very much under the control of the German army. And uh, Daimler is appointed the director. And this put a ton of people's noses out of joint. They were used to the most famous of the famous uh, physicists running 
the KWIP. Uh, and all of a sudden here comes this random dude from the army taking control and ordering them around. That that was not something that anybody was particularly pleased to have happen. So um, after the first several meetings and discussions about how, how to move forward, uh, the, the scientists dispersed to their individual laboratories and they began focusing on different parts of the project. Early experiments focused on addressing the technical problems because there wasn't a ready supply of either uranium uh, in a usable format or heavy water. So some work started on isotope separations that never got very far during the course of the war, but Hartek uh, focused on that for, for quite some time. There was also a lot of discussion about the correct geometry and size of a critical reactor. This is one of the most important distinctions uh, in this story. So Heisenberg, because he was the theoretician, preferred the simpler math of a layered reactor design. So that's layers of uranium with layers of moderator. They could either be stacked like a lasagna or there were some experiments that involved uh, spherical layers like an onion, but he liked this sort of layered two-dimensional structure. Dibner said, no, that doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to have spheres or as close as you can get to spheres of uranium dispersed in a three-dimensional lattice of moderator. But of course, um, Dibner, because he was the second raider, was not really listened to. Um, Heisenberg was theoretically supposed to be working on his own experiments at the University of Leipzig, um, but he also ended up taking a train into Berlin every other week to consult with the scientists of the KWIP. They invited him there uh, because they really didn't believe that Dibner was the person who ought to be leading them. So in effect, Heisenberg found himself in charge of both major experimental uh, programs, experimental uh, reactor designs um, that were being constructed in the early years of the war. So they were layered. There were no three-dimensional lattice designs uh, for several years. Um, so in 1943, all of that sort of changes. Dibner was replaced by Heisenberg at the KWIP because the uh, army sort of let go of control of, of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. They had sort of understood that the likelihood that a nuclear weapon was going to be built was very, very low. And at that point in the war, there was a lot of allied pressure um, coming from the Western front and they um, and the Russians, of course, on the east. And they were in a tight spot. They needed to figure out where to put their resources and money. And it was determined that building a nuclear weapon was really not on the table in the time that they needed it. Uh, so the KWIP was released. Daimler was out. Heisenberg was in, and Dibner took this opportunity to move his research to a small military installation south of Berlin called Gotau. He moved some materials, he moved some scientists, uh, and he began constructing the three-dimensional lattice reactor experiments that he had been wanting to <laughs> construct for years. And by the end of 1944, the results that Dibner was getting, the neutron multiplication that were coming out of his very limited number of reactor experiments were so much better than the layered designs that Heisenberg finally relented and started to have his large flat plates of uranium metal cut into uh, squares that could be stacked into cubes. They also ordered a bunch of metallic cubes uh, from the supplier who was making the, the uranium metal. Uh, so there was a shift at the very end uh, to this three-dimensional lattice structure. However, at the same time, uh, in the middle of 1944, Allied bombing of particularly Berlin and had really increased and it became a very dangerous place to continue to be. Uh, so all research was ordered to leave the Berlin area. And there were two sort of places that, that they went to. Gatow, uh, Dibner's research at Gatow was moved to this little town called Statlum in the central region of Germany, where he sort of set things up in a um, secondary school basement and, and waited essentially for the war to sort of wind down. The... Um, the KWIP uh, research was moved from Berlin to the tiny town of Hagerlach, where Alsos would eventually find all of those materials uh, in a few months. There was a brief moment uh, when everything that was evacuated from Berlin and Gatow was all together in Statlum. And there was talk at the time of trying to combine both reactor programs um, experiments into the largest possible reactor that they could build. Uh, but Heisenberg would have none of that. So he 
personally went from uh, the, the Black Forest region where he was staying up to Statland to retrieve his materials and bring them back down to begin constructing what would be his final nuclear reactor experiment. As I mentioned, the lab, uh, such as it was in Hagerlach, was built inside of this tiny little uh, cellar inside of a cliff um, in this beautiful tiny town. Uh, it is unchanged from when it, they found it in 1945. Uh, I imagine it's unchanged from a considerable time before that, <laughs> but you can see what it looked like when the allies uh, arrived and you can see a picture that I took last year. Um, there's virtually no difference, except now instead of a uh, sort of laboratory in the beer cellar, it's this darling museum called the Adam Keller where everything's in German, but it has some beautiful <laughs> dioramas and a full scale model of what the reactor core would have looked like. Um, and it's very much worth the, the little trip if you find yourself in that region. The final reactor experiment, which was codenamed B8B for Berlin, even though they'd moved, uh, involved 664 cubes of uranium metal tied together with aircraft cable in long chains in this sort of weird chandelier thing that was suspended from an annular lid that could be lowered into the pit that had been dug in the floor and the pit was filled with heavy water. So that was the moderator material that they'd chosen to use uh, throughout the whole program. And it, they built it. And it was not a critical reactor. Heisenberg himself in his book, uh, Neutron Physics, Nuclear Physics, Nuclear Physics, um, says that it would have needed to be about 50% larger to work. That's sort of confirmed-ish by some um, recent modeling that's been done of the reactor core. However, more recent work suggests that even if they had 50% more, it likely would not have been a critical reactor. So exactly how far the Germans were um, from a critical reactor, which is of course miles still from any kind of nuclear weapon, uh, is, is a bit up for debate, but they were not anywhere close with the B8 reactor experiment. So that that is quite clear. Um, so how and why the Germans failed so significantly is one of the most interesting questions of this whole story. Um, as the Americans had assumed that the Germans were working at a similar pace towards creating a nuclear weapon, the Germans had assumed that the Americans were keeping things mostly on an academic scale. And so when the uh, bombs were dropped on Japan and it became public that this, this new type of weapon existed, uh, the scientists who had been involved in Germany's nuclear program were all interned at Farm Hall, which is an estate just outside of London uh, in the United Kingdom. And there are some just fantastic recordings of the conversations that they had uh, as they sort of processed their disbelief at how wrong they had been about how the Americans had been working and about how wrong they had been about the feasibility of, of the project that they had been tasked with. Um, so I, I'll read just a little bit of it because it's just wonderful. But Han said, uh, I don't believe it, to which Heisenberg replied, oh, Han is Otto Han, to which Warner Heisenberg replied, all I can suggest is that some dilettante in America who knows nothing about it has bluffed them in saying, if you drop this, it has the equivalent of 20,000 tons of high explosive. And in reality, it doesn't work at all. Han replied, at any rate, Heisenberg, you're just a second rater and you may as well pack up. Um, Heisenberg says, I quite agree. Han says they're 50 years further advanced than us. And Heisenberg says, I don't believe a word of the whole thing. And eventually they sort of work out what had happened and, and uh, where they had made some of their mistakes along the way. And um, it becomes clear to them that they, they had not accomplished something that the Americans had accomplished. And there's this interesting change in how they're talking about the project uh, and their goals for, for nuclear fission. Um, they attempt, they fairly uh, blatantly attempt to change the, the narrative to this idea that they did not intend to create a nuclear weapon. They were just trying to use nuclear fission for energy production. And that that's not something that they think building such a terrible weapon was not something that they would do. So there was this amount of spin that they tried to put on the project um, and to justify their failure to, you know, uh, try to, to uh, turn the narrative in their favor, which I think is very, very interesting to sort of watch as it changes throughout time. Okay. So that's, the second part, the third part of the project is the weirdest uh, part of the, the note, which is Gift of Nininger. So Tim, do you want to tell this this bit? Because it's 
your little quick moments of fate. Yeah, well, this um, uranium, the second uranium cube came to me uh, through just the most unlikely of circumstances. I was out for a jog in, in College Park on a hot uh, August day and uh, very near my birthday. And I get a phone call from our radiation safety officer who I work with uh, pretty closely. And she says, Tim, where are you? And I described, she says, well, I'll, I'll meet you in the nearest parking lot in about five minutes. So I did. Uh, so you just have the scene of me in jogging shorts and a sweaty t-shirt. And uh, she gets out of the, her car and opens the trunk of her car. And there's a little lunch satchel with some brown paper around it. And then in it was a, a cube with a an edge poking out and it had one of the telltale notches and that's all I could see and uh, of course we dug into it and pulled this piece of paper off of it and which said taken from Germany for nuclear reactor Hitler tried to build a uh, gift of Ninager and she so even before reading it I knew what it was and she says do you know what this is and I said I do but do you know what this is you know I try to keep my my calm and and suppress any enthusiasm that uh, second one of these cubes is coming into my life so i said yeah this really looks like one of the cubes from the german nuclear reactor uh that was being built throughout world war ii and she goes yes and that she says it's consistent with this note and uh, she hands the whole thing to me and says happy birthday the uh the story was that uh this nininger um well a, a a geologist had passed away and this was left in his personal effects and they didn't know what to do with it so they they handed it to the university's radiation safety group to dispose of it but she felt it had some historical significance and really should not be disposed of and handed it to me but i didn't know who nininger was and in fact if you look at the spelling on the paper and the handwriting it's a little tough i wasn't sure if it was nininja or and i, I googled it um, and nothing came up um uh, and about a month later, just a few weeks later, I was at an annual uh, science event where uh, there's a lot of nuclear re related things and hobbyists and so forth. And I was going through a, a book of technical books and, and <laughs> that were for sale. And up pops this one, Minerals for Atomic Energy by Robert D. Nininger. So what are the chances this is the same Nininger? So just a few weeks later later uh I, I get the answer um so the time was right he worked for the atomic energy commission he was a geologist charged with finding materials for the nuclear program including uranium and beryllium and, and so forth uh, so i bought the book it was probably one of the best ten dollars i've ever spent and uh, got back to my office and started doing again using google to to search and sure enough robert dean ninninger lived in bethesda maryland <laughs> which is about five miles away from uh, my office and uh, called that uh, the phone number that was listed and it was his home phone number and uh, uh, somebody answered and and uh, a, a sweet old lady said do not call back here and bam and slammed the phone down <laughs> and I said all right uh, let me let me try again and I realized I was calling around dinner time um, and I said please please don't hang up please don't hang up and uh I said, I tried as fast as I could to convince her to stay on the phone. And uh, sure enough, she confirmed that her husband was Robert D. Nininger and that he had passed away just a few years earlier. So the chance to get the story was, was gone with him and that he had given all of his mineral collection or well, that all of his mineral collection had been given to his friend at the University of Maryland. And that friend uh, had been deceased and that's how it was transferred ultimately to me. So that this this of course then that that phone call solidified my desire to pursue this uh other than just having it as an artifact in the in the collection so to really uncover this story so i you hear of ransom notes wrapped around stones thrown through in a window and I, I see this little note here is that ransom note thrown through the window of history at me and it hit me right in the head and uh we've been working on it ever since <laughs> Uh, what a great story that is. It really is interesting how you came upon the uh, uranium cubes. Okay, Mary, we so, got the floor so for it. 
actually, if I if I may, uh, this one too, because this ties into Oak Ridge a little bit too. Okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I I in this form has come to us in multiple fashions, and and uh, uh, Ray, uh, you put me in touch with uh, Tim Gawney, who put me in touch with a gentleman at the Atlanta Archives. Yeah. And that gentleman, I can't remember his name, came up with this document. But interestingly, Cameron Reed came up with this document too and several other people, which had searchable files for the Manhattan Engineering District. And of course, came up with this name of Robert Dean Inninger. It was a memo from the Mary Hill area of the Manhattan Project. So that, Mimi will get into that. Uh, it was written in February of 1945. Keep that date in mind. So this is just two, three months prior to the April ALSO submission that discovered all of these cubes. And it stated that Robert D. Nininger has been appointed the accountability property officer for Mary Hill area. So that means accountability property uh, officer for all uranium uh, starting March 1st, 1945. So six, seven weeks before the ALSOS mission. So uh, this is an initial appointment and not a change in property accountability officer. So this is a new, new role that Robert D. Nininger has put into. So he's responsible for keeping track of all of the uranium in the Manhattan Project uh, effort in the in the uh, at least the Mary Hill area, and Mimi will explain more about that. Yeah, but let me mention Joel Walker is the man that you contacted down at Atlanta. Yes, yes. He uh, he also made arrangements for me to come into those archives, some five thousand cubic feet <laughs> of archives from Oak Ridge. So. Joel's retired since then. Sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. No, 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 but that's great. So um, th this made me convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that if somebody in charge of all of the uranium uh, acquires uh, all of the uh, the Hegerlock uranium, which is about one and a half tons of uh, clean material, what would you do with it in uh, Mar uh, April of 1945. I figured you'd send it immediately to Oak Ridge for processing and that this would be put into the front end of the uh, the calutrons and the whole process and and ultimately would wind up in the uh, core of the little boy bomb that was then delivered in August, early August of 1945. So I was just convinced of this. And, th and this is one of the uh, reasons I was excited to tell you about this to see if we could track that down. And uh, the truth is, I couldn't have been further wrong. Uh, the materials feedstock program was very mature at this point. All of the material that was necessary for the little boy bomb had already been accrued, and there was really no need for this uranium whatsoever. So uh, I do get asked that question frequently, and Mimi does too. And the answer is no, uh, the German uranium was not delivered to Japan. But I'll let Mimi uh, go from there with the final disposition really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of what we know, we know from the people that were involved and the names um, and the documents at the National Archives. And I always feel like this bit of the story is the most boring to show because it's going to be a bunch of documents and like organizational charts, but it was also the most exciting part of the the research for me because you see a name that you recognize and it's like, it's the most exciting <laughs> <laughs> when you find what you're looking for. Um, I'm a scientist in my actual life when I'm not doing this. And it's very similar to like getting the data that you want or getting something to work. The like, oh, moment of, oh, oh gosh, that's perfect. Um, so I, I hope everybody finds that as fun as I do. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about what Murray Hill is, uh, this is sort of the, the quote that always comes to mind. This is Niels Bohr to Edward Teller in the years after the war, where he said, I told you it couldn't be done without turning the whole country into a factory. And what he means by that is that there wasn't a company, a university, a national lab, anything in the United States that hadn't somehow by the end of the war become a small cog in the massive machine that was the Manhattan Project. Everybody uh, was mobilized towards this goal including the, the Murray Hill area. They all had, all of the companies and things like that were given these code names. And so that's what makes it a little tricky to figure out who was connected to whom. Uh, but if you look at this particular org chart, for example, the Manhattan district was divided into several, several sub areas, one of which was called the Madison Square area, which was involved in materials procurement generally, 
Um, one of the sub sub areas of the Ma Madison Square area was the Murray Hill area, which was the code name that was given to a project uh, that was contracted out to the Union Mines Development Corporation. So what the Union Mines was doing was a survey of all of the um, sources of uranium around the world. They wanted to figure out where to get uranium. At the time, there were really only two sources that were known. There were the Yakimstal mines in uh, the Czech Republic, in Bavaria at the time. And there was also the uh, mines in the Belgian Congo. And those were really the only two sources that were known uh, and being actively mined. And both were complicated uh, to access. And Groves really didn't want to get to this point at the end of the war where they'd managed to build all of these uh, facilities, develop this new technology, build these nuclear weapons, and then not have any materials with which to continue building weapons. Uh, and he, he really had an arsenal in mind, not just the weapons that were eventually delivered. Um, so to do that, they needed to figure out where uranium could be in the world. They also were hoping to corner the market, if at all possible, and keep the Soviet Union from having access to any potentially large sources of uranium. Uh, so to do that, they began looking at the literature. So Union Mines was contracted to go through all of the available literature in every language they could find, um, of you know, all the ge geology journals and books and things like that to try to figure out where there might be other sources of uranium around the globe. This effort, the Murray Hill area, was led by Paul Guerin, who was a mechanical engineer who had worked in the Texas oil industry when he was selected for this job. He was a character in and of himself. Um, he was aided by a small team of geologists, uh, one of whom was Nininger, who helped him sort of interpret the, the results that were coming out of the literature search and identify meaningful sources of uranium. George Bain in particular, who was at Amherst, um, had a particularly good uh, nose for finding these uranium sources. He identified a significant, like millions of dollars worth significant source of uranium in South Africa because he remembers that he had an interesting rock he picked up there in his collection back home and he got on the train back to Amherst to pick it up and bring it back. And lo and behold, here's this massive source of uranium. He also predicted that uranium should be found in monzonite sands along with thorium, which was uh, also proved correct. Together with the rest of the Murray Hill team, they determined that Colorado was a good source of domestic uranium um, and that the Arctic Circle and Ontario were options. They contracted with the El Dorado Mining Company. There was also the purchase of the Congolese uranium uh, through the Belgian government, which is an interesting story. The um, entirety of the uh, uranium that came out of the Congo was owned by a Belgian company called Union Minerai. Um, and as the Germans were making their way towards Belgium, the head of that company, who eventually like moved to New York to stay out of the, the war, um, had a shipment, a large shipment of uranium oxide, which was in uh, warehouses in Belgium, shipped to the United States. And it was sitting there on a wharf in, in New York for months and months. And so the uh, head of, of the Manhattan Engineer District was trying to figure out whether or not they could potentially purchase uranium oxide, uranium ore from um, this company, even though Belgium was under... German control at the time. And so he went to this man and said, we, we'd like to try to open the mines again or, or some, some way to, to gain access to this material. And the head of Union Minerai said, you know, we've had thousands of pounds of it sitting here in New York City for, for forever. Um, so, and you are welcome to buy it if you want. <laughs> That's what happened, um, which I think is particularly interesting because it was such a large amount of uranium ore that was processed and eventually used in the weapons that, that were delivered in Japan. Um, but that source, the, the Congolese uranium uh, that hadn't been moved to the United States, that was instead captured by the Germans, was also what was fueling the German nuclear program. So it was the same source of uranium that had been split uh, and was fueling both sides of, of the, the development war. Um, so that's that's a fun story. And that's why the Manhattan Project is called the Manhattan Project, because it was all in Manhattan. Um, <laughs> uh, we believe that the cubes themselves, when they were taken by the Combined Development Trust, which was this sort of large uh, legal body that was trying to make sure that uranium was captured uh, 
and and uh, obtained and shared equally between the the British Canadians and Americans. We believe that they transferred the cubes to Paris or from Paris to the United States, um, and then. Murray Hill suddenly was in charge of them and the newly appointed property accountability officer must have opened one of the crates and said oh these are cool as a geologist and just pulled one off the top of the pile to keep for fun uh there are several cubes that ended up being um souvenirs at various points throughout this whole story so it's not that uh that surprising that someone would do that and it's also helped us sort of piece together and and place the cubes with the Murray Hill area in New York so then the question becomes, okay, is there a box of uranium cubes sitting somewhere in New York? Which unfortunately the answer to that is no. So what happened next? Uh, you have to look at another org chart. This one shows the Murray Hill area, um, all situated under uh, the, the Madison Square area. So this was eventually Wilbur Kelly at the time it was uh, Ruoff, but you see that Murray Hill is listed here. And then a couple of lines above, you see this other area called Beverly. The reason that this jumped out at me was the name D. Duffy, which was a name I'd seen before in the context of this story. So the Beverly area became the next topic of interest. If you look at the org chart for the Beverly area at the National Archives, it's very small. The area engineer is Lieutenant Dick Duffy, which is the name that I'd recognized. And he has one other person working for him. Uh, that's Dick Duffy there. But it turns out that the Beverly area was the code name given to another contracting uh, uh, company that was uh, called Metal Hydrides Incorporated, which had been founded in 1937 by Dr. Peter Alexander. He had developed a method for converting uranium oxide to uranium metal powder using calcium hydroxide. And the creation of uranium metal for the various experiments that were happening in the early days, uh, pre, pre Chicago Pile One, was a really large challenge that the Manhattan Project continually faced. It was also a challenge in Germany as well. So the ability to create metal powder uh, was about as good as it was going to get uh, for the time being. They eventually came up with a better way to do it. I will note that uranium metal powder is pyrophoric. So it sometimes just catches fire and you can't put it out until it's burned its way out. Um, and that that proved to be a problem uh, at the site where they were creating all of this material. So in 1942, uh, me metal hydrides was contracted to produce uranium metal powder. But by 1943, a better method for producing uranium had been developed and most of that moved to St. Louis. Um, so instead, metal hydrides was turned into a reprocessing plant where they would take the turnings and scrap uranium metal from all of the different Manhattan Project sites and turn it back into a usable form that could be then you know, put back into the feed cycle and, and used again. So they were trying to use as much of uh, the uranium that they had available as possible. So it seems reasonable to me that... Um, if you have a big box of uranium cubes that you're not sure what to do with, that sending them to the uh, plant that is handling scrap uranium metal like this uh, seems reasonable. And the reason that we're pretty sure that that is what happens is because Dick Duffy also had a cube. <laughs> so this is actually the very first cube that Tim came into contact with. Um, Dick Duffy, it turns out, uh, was the second director of the Maryland University Training Reactor, which is the reactor that Tim was in charge of a few oh. decades later. Oh. Okay, so that so sort of helps us tie it. Yeah, that's exactly. a connection. Yes. Yep, it all brings it full circle around the Maryland University training reactor somehow. Um, so Dick Duffy is this gentleman here. This is his cube. It looks slightly different than the other one. Um, there's a coating that's been placed around it, uh, but it's still very much, very, very obviously one of the the Heisenberg cubes um, that are part of this this story. So that's sort of what we think must have happened. They were reprocessed to scrap and you know eventually used in the production of some nuclear warhead somewhere. Um, and I, I, might, I might comment just quickly, uh, Tim. How many cubes do you know of? Or oh. Mimi, how many do you know of? So oh. this, <laughs> I'll lead right into it. This is what I call the new uranium club. So this is like the group of people in the world who have suddenly somehow found themselves the stewards of these objects. And some of them are more aware of the, the significance of the objects than others. 
Um, in general, there were two groups of uranium cubes, the 664 that belonged to Heisenberg's final experiment in Hagerloch. Those mostly made their way to the United States. Um, there's one that's in Paris with uh, Marie Curie's granddaughter. She uses it as a doorstop. Um, there's also one at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. There's a few others that are in private collections. And then the cube, of course, that, that started this whole story, for me at least, is at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on loan from Tim. There were also 400-ish cubes that were um, under the control of uh, Dibner in Statlam and then in Gatow and then Statlam. Uh, and those ended up mostly in the hands of ALSOS mission members. So Samuel Houchmitt took two of them. One is with one of his personal friends. One um, ended up at the Los Alamos Historic Society. John Lansdale took a cube and it's now in the living room of his daughter, Sally. Um, so they sort of made their way around. Edwin Kemble took one. It is now used in introductory physics class demos at Harvard University. Um, there's one at Bonn University in Germany. We believe that a majority of them ended up in the USSR. There's a few other like little loose end stories, but in total, there are 14 that we're aware of. We are hoping that there are a couple more to be found out there. We'll see. We'll see what turns up. Um, I have some suspicions about who must have taken a cube, but I haven't been able to prove those. Uh, but you can kind of see how they're all related in this this web of people who are connected through these objects. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing chart you've drawn. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of really cool names <laughs> oh my goodness yeah so and then all of this and quite a bit more is in in the book um that i have been able to pull together through all of this research and i'm so excited to to finally be able to talk about it and there's there's so many pieces that really writing a book was the only way to be able to effectively communicate this whole story so i'm thrilled to have been able to do that well, I'm glad, and as I mentioned to Tim, my book is on its way, and mentioned to you, Mimi, as well. It'll be here on Tuesday, so I'm Wonderful. looking forward to getting to take a look at the book. Thank you so much for that informative, very informative presentation, and Tim, you're correct. This is a gold mine of information about the uranium cubes that most of us, I mean, I've held one in my hand, thanks to you, but most of us had no idea of the extent of how these tubes have cubes have traveled around the world. So thank you all both so much. Uh, well, thank you for having us. You know, I, I mentioned that Richard Rhodes started me on this this journey, and it was his book that opened my eyes to the Manhattan Project history, which I was instantly captivated by and tried to read everything I possibly can and uh, a near obsession. So it it then becomes a uh, a life honor to have been able to contribute to a gap missing in the big picture, and these cubes represent uh, the physical representations of the program that launched the Manhattan Project. So they yeah. they weigh they weigh a lot, uh, but they're massive in terms of its hit, their history. So it's it's awesome. Uh, yeah. The cube that is on the the cover of Mimi's book is uh, a prominent display at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque. And, Which is uh, an awesome museum. If anyone's yeah. ever driving through, it's totally worth visiting. And then yeah, you'll see our, our photos on the wall next to yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Walter is a good friend of mine. He just retired yeah. from heading that museum, but I agree with you. It's an excellent museum. Mm -hmm. And, and Jim Walter's name also appears in the back of the book. Oh, good. Giving, giving good. Praise, so. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, well thank Keith, you so that, much. Yeah. Thank you, Tim and Mimi. That uh, that really brings some good information that uh, that I'm happy to see us able to share. What else did you, you wanted to talk about today? The Oppenheimer movie? Well, you know, we do have, and we've talked about this before, so I won't belabor it, but we do have the Oppenheimer movie that's coming out this week. Mm -hmm. um, end of the week, of course, there's going to be a special screening of it here in Oak Ridge right. uh, the day before it officially opens. Uh, I saw where the, uh, uh, and we won't, we won't talk too much about it, but I saw where they had the, the London or the UK premiere of Oppenheimer oh. yesterday. Yeah. And in a, in a, uh, an interesting twist on things, and me being a film guy and running a film festival for 20 years, I'm kind of 
attuned to these these things that happen the um the writers union and the actors union in hollywood have both gone on strike this is the first time in 63 years that they have both gone on strike at the same time and what that does is that puts a lot of uh, restrictions on what those union members can do right. and it was interesting they went uh, the cast of oppenheimer they were at the the premiere the gala premiere the red carpet premiere in the uk they went there early so they could be out front because they were anticipating the strike to be voted on and as soon as they got word that the strike was voted on they left the theater yeah um and christopher nolan says that he completely supports you know them doing that um, you know, that's a, that's a union thing. So it's going to, it's going to impact, uh, this may be the last good, uh, summer of, of movies that we have, you know, for a little there's while. About, yep. there's about four, there's about four or five movies that I want to see this summer that I haven't <laughs> seen yet. And of course, Oppenheimer's right there on the, on the list, but, oh, yeah. but Rob, and, and, and another thing that I read this, uh, just this morning, um, Robert Downey Jr., who plays Louis Strauss in the in the film, of course he's Iron Man, and you know he's he's a big big movie star, but he was quoted as saying, "This is the Oppenheimer is the best film he's ever been in." Yes. So I mean, you know, there has been so much hmm. uh, a buzz about this film, and uh, you know, it, it's just I I can't wait to see it, and uh, I'm anxious to talk to. Uh, Kai Bird next is it next yeah. week or is it no weeks? it's on the 29th we'll 29th. talk to Kai on the 29th we'll have him as our special guest and we can talk about his book American Prometheus I'm sure he's just tied up right now because yeah. Yeah, you know is. he'll be in Los Alamos I'm sure when they show the film there and that the, I saw an interview of, of most of the leading characters mm -hmm. uh, on uh, last night I was watching it and I was impressed not only with what Robert Downey Jr. said about the most important in, uh, film he's been in, mm -hmm. but also Matt Damon had just a great commentary about how important this whole idea of what Oppenheimer did uh, literally changed our world. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's great to see these people who are uh, well known to make those kinds of statements. I mean, Keith and I and Tim and Miriam, we've been saying it for a long time, <laughs> but, yeah. but they kind of listen to folks like Matt Damon a little more than they do. <laughs> they, they will listen to Matt Damon a little bit more than they will to Ray Smith and Keith. That's Smith. right. You they got it. certainly get more. You know, it's kind of, and I, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's just a, I think it's a great opportunity for the public yeah. to be educated about our history and the history of the Manhattan Project. Yeah, let me add one more plug. On Wednesday, the 19th at 6 o'clock, we're having a panel session at the Oak Ridge High School that will in include some of the high school students, but also some uh, scientists, as, as well as myself. I'm lucky to be on, on the panel. And then after we've had a panel discussion, my part will just be the history of how did the Manhattan Project come about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but after we've done that, we're going to watch a documentary, Oppenheimer After Trinity. Right. Now, this is a, a different documentary than the one that came out on NBC uh, last week. And I, a, a third documentary is being produced by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Right. It will be available for the public on August the 14th. Hmm. So we've got lots of things coming out about Oppenheimer now. And uh, I even found some biographies that I didn't even know existed. So there's a lot of information out there about Oppenheimer. And All by right. the way, Keith, I have a ticket to to the IMAX theater in Chattanooga on Friday. Oh, well, good. Yeah, I was going to say every, every year uh, for the past 25 years, uh, myself and another friend, have hosted a, a weekend event we call High Voltage Weekend. And it's where any tinkers, and, and it can be high voltage, high energy, nuclear, whatever, we get together and we do demonstrations, the things that we've been working on through the year. And, and we also, uh, it's there's good food and good company. And it's uh, 80 invitations went out this year. Get, the first one is about five, five people in the inaugural event back in 1998 uh, or, or so. And uh, this year, 
uh, high voltage weekend, just coincidentally the same weekend as the premiere of Oppenheimer. So we have about 25 tickets in our group uh, at our local IMAX theater. So we're going, Mimi will be there too. And yep. uh, it, you're absolutely right about uh, a list of wonderful movies that uh, uh, my wife and I two weekends ago, um, or I guess just a weekend ago, went to the actual theater for the first time since the pandemic. And, and it was to see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And, and it was a good movie. I uh, Mimi uh, and I don't see eye to eye on Indiana Jones, but uh, I, I did say I, 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 could relate. I, could, I could relate. As a, guy, as a film guy, people ask me all the time, what is your favorite movie? And I say my favorite movie of all time is Raiders of the Lost Ark. A absolutely. Very first one. And uh, I can relate as a professor hunting Nazi artifacts and trying to get them into museums. There's, there's yeah, a, a, a... <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> one more thing before we close, Tim, you will come back and be on with us again. I'll schedule with you and we'll get you to talk about other things that you've been involved with, not just a little cube of uranium. Okay. There all are right. many, well, many secrets. For no, he does. And Mimi, thank you again. And thank I'm so you. forward to reading your book. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all. And folks, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. We'll be back in a couple of weeks.